welcome to this time of worship this morning. We've been, we've been practicing worship for this moment when we could actually worship. What does that mean? That means there's times we just sing songs, isn't it? There's times when we just go through the words. What I want to do this morning is invite you to enter into worship, focusing on music and who's playing and what's happening up here, but focusing on the Lord and entering into his presence. It's a privilege to worship the Lord. It's, it's an honor to worship him because he's worthy. And he looks for our worship. You know, he looks, he looks to see if our hearts are in tune with him. One of the things us guitarists try to do is keep our guitars in tune. Doesn't mean we, that just it helps to be in tune. I'm not going to say any more than that. It helps to be in tune. It helps us, our hearts to be in tune with God. We're going to come this morning and just pray and ask the Lord to tune us up, to get us in that place where, regardless of people around you, you're worshiping God in spirit and truth. Father, as we come into your presence this morning, we thank you for the welcome that you give us. As a father welcomes his children, you welcome us. As as a God who's created us for worship, for praise, to honor and glorify you, it's an honor for us to come and glorify you this morning. We come with glad hearts, hearts that rejoice in you, hearts that proclaim your goodness. God who never fails us, a God who loves us, whose love never fails. We thank you. Let's stand and sing. The world may fail, but you will remain.
we stay flowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I heard three people thankful. Let's see if we can improve that over this song. For all that you've done. salvation in the name of Jesus. We're thankful for each other, Lord, this morning. We're thankful that we can be in this place again and worship and gather. That you're gathering people unto yourself in every place where worship is opening up again. That you're rebuilding the church. You're rebuilding your people. You're rebuilding the community. People belonging to each other and saying that we belong. That we are yours. We thank you for that. We thank you that you're doing a gracious work among us. And we'll give you all the praise. Let's turn to someone near you and welcome. I see some new people here this morning. I won't point them out, don't want to embarrass them, but you know who they are, go and say hello. Greet each other and we'll come back and sing you more songs. Good greetings. How are you going? Have a cup of tea up.
starting so that'll be exciting so hopefully all the families will be gathered back by then our school has started again we don't specifically have an offering time anymore in church doesn't mean we don't need and accept and receive and re rejoice in your giving and thank you for that so just a reminder that this is a time as we're singing that song thank you lord it's great to be reminded that in gratitude we also share the things with other people share what, what we have whether it's supporting our missionaries the ministries of this church just being here this morning, uh, supporting Somerset, um, hands at work, work um, you know, supporting uh, Sunlink. All of those things are part of God's ministry through this place. And so uh, just a word of thank you. Thank you for giving. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being a generous person. You can give online, which is the easiest thing to do. There are There is an offering receptacle at the back. Uh, we just don't pass it around. The other thing to be reminded is Friendship Group starts uh, this Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Uh, Wilmy is somewhere else. Wilmy, there we go. Wilmy's over there in the fuchsia from the top. And so, if you want to, if you want to ask more about that, that's just anyone's welcome. Uh, Tuesday, one o'clock. And that'd be great. Nothing more precious to a believer than the cross of Christ and the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. There's nothing, nothing greater in a sense because it's what brings us into a relationship with Him. And so, just uh, as we sing this, it's a reminder that the cross is overcome the grave it's overcome death In the cross of christ we have freedom we have joy we have that peace that comes that passes all human understanding let's stand and worship the lord together
come to a time of prayer. Um, I'm aware of uh, a few needs that are in our church family here, and maybe you know of others. But um, yeah, let, let's come and pray. We particularly want to give our condolences to Michael and Rose on the death of Michael's sister last Sunday, I believe. Um, she's been sick for quite some time, so yeah. And also we pray for Carmen, who's one of our worship team, who's not able to be with us because of an injury to her foot. That's uh, she's got some problems with that. So, and we we've had a number in our church family who have contracted COVID over time. Uh, so we're hearing of different ones who've been sick, and we're just thankful to God that many of you are back here today who have been sick, and um, we ask for God's continued healing and for any who are suffering at the moment. Let's pray now. Lord, when we come to prayer, we come with hearts of thanksgiving for your loving kindness to us. You are so good to us. You bless us abundantly. Even as Carl was talking this morning, you bless us with the rain to water the earth and to give us sustenance. And Lord, there are so many things when we look around us that we can be thankful and grateful for. For our church family here today, we're so thankful. For those who've come today, may they be blessed. May they know the abundance of your love toward them and may they know the richness of fellowship and being together as a, a church family, as a family of God's people, just living together and loving one another and caring for one another. We think of those with special needs today and... Uh, for those who are grieving, Lord, our hearts go out to them. We think of Michael and Rose today in, in their loss. And we know that there are others struggling and suffering with those who have recently passed away and, and also some who are just close to the last days of their lives. Lord, bring comfort and healing to those who are in that place today. Lord, I lift Carmen to you today and ask for healing for her foot and peace for her soul through this time, Lord, that she might um, just know the real richness of your presence with her today. And Lord, we bring those known to us personally or even our own needs to you, Lord, for um, things that are difficult for, for those who are suffering, Lord. Just ask for them for each one. Lift our hearts to you. We lift those we love to you, Lord, that you would just be very present with them, that they would know your love and mercy, and that they would know healing in their bodies and in their minds and in their souls. Lord, we, we pray for our community. This COVID disease has has just seemed to run loose through our community at this time and there are many who have been sick, some very sick, some have just struggled to um, get, get through it and, and the isolation period and even the isolation has been so difficult for some. We lift each one to you, Lord, and just ask for your mercy upon them. For those who are currently sick, we just ask that you'll protect them and keep them and strengthen them, draw near to them at this time, Lord, of, of illness. And Lord, there are people sick in other ways too. COVID seems to be our focus, but there are many who suffer. And we just lift each one to you and ask for your hand of mercy upon them today. And in our church, Lord, we, uh, we come to the beginning of a, a, another year, another school year, and many ministries recommencing and we just ask for those who are involved in those ministries, particularly those who are leading them, that you would give them the strength and the energy and the vision for this new year. And we pray for ministries that don't have leaders at the moment, that there'll be people appointed to these roles that by you, Lord, and that these people will know that call upon their life to step up into this place. We pray particularly for our board at this time, uh, at particularly next weekend as they go away for a time of retreat, a time of uh, planning and visioning for the year and 
um, just being united in one purpose, knowing what you are saying to them. May they hear your voice individually and collectively and know, Lord, what your purpose is for this church community this year. May we be willing to hear that vision and to follow and to work together, Lord, um, not just to sit back and let the leaders do their thing, but to stand together shoulder to shoulder and do the work that we need to do to be effective in this community. And Lord, we send out people into mission from this church too, and we support and care for them, both financially and prayerfully and in other ways. And we ask, Lord, for each one that is sent out and supported from here, that that we will be committed and faithful to them, that you'll prosper them in the work that they're doing. And we think particularly this morning of Lauren Hornby in Frankston. Lord, you, you've gifted this woman with a passion for the work that she's doing and, and you love her and you've made her fruitful in that place. I pray particularly for your supply for her, Lord, when she is in need. May she just know the abundance of your provision for her every day. And may she know the joy of serving you in that place. May she see the rewards, the fruit of her labour. May there be people that she ministers to who come to know and love you because of her presence there. So, Lord, we just pray that you'll just draw each one of us into that place of loving and serving you as you intend for us to. May we hear your word and may we do your will. May we be faithful in all things. Speak to us now through the word of God that we might hear from you what you want to say to us today. Amen. Amen. To uh, share with you from Matthew chapter 13 today. And a couple of weeks ago, um, last week, Carl was back in Philippians with us, and I want to take us back to uh, Matthew 13, and it's the parable of the weeds. The time of year to talk about weeds. <laughs> Dawn, I did some weeding in your garden. I know it's a shock. But I, I just sort of prepare myself for this message. I don't weed very often. Why Dawn put her hands on her head in shock when she came and said that. Because weeds have a habit of just coming back, don't they? I mean, I pulled out a lot of weeds. I think I've done my bit for the year. But Dawn does weeding so often. Let's uh, have a look at Matthew 13. And I want to read from verse uh, 24. And then uh, there's a parable of the mustard seed in the yeast. We'll come back to that another time. But the explanation for the weeds being explained is from verse 36. So we'll just cover those two passages. Matthew 13 and verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And the enemy did this, he replied, and the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Verse 36, Then he left the crowd and went into a house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be with the, at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. 
The parable of the good seed and the weeds comes after the parable of the sower. And if you remember the parable of the sower, which we didn't read, but we've looked at it in the past, it's about sowing seed into the hearts of people. In other words, the soil in that parable is the hearts of people. So the sower is the one who sows the word of God and it lands in the soil of people's hearts. Some of it, as you remember, was good soil, but some was rocky. Some had thorns in it. Some had thorns, weeds, and some uh, just snatched away. It was like hard soil. But the parable, as Jesus goes on, and this is the very next parable, he shifts from the soil being the hearts of people to being the world in which we live. So there's a, a shift in his analogy here. There's a shift in the picture. It, uh, it fits in the context of Matthew 13, which is all about the kingdom of God. And if there's anything that we would benefit from greatly is to focus on God's kingdom, to understand the power, the presence, the purpose of God's kingdom. Uh, I've heard many sermons about the church. I've probably preached a few. Uh, and there is a place for the church. It's in the New Testament. It's very, very good to preach about that. But at the heart of that, at the heart of the church and the purpose of the church is still God's kingdom. So in this story that Jesus shares about, about the, 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 the good seed and the weeds, the man who goes out to sow his field is the son of man. In other words, it's Jesus. And the field is the world. So here's, here's the big picture that Jesus is trying to give his disciples. That God actually owns this world and he hasn't abandoned ownership. Uh, for those of you who are in uh, roles as landlords, you know what it's like when someone takes possession of a house that you've got responsibility for. It's very difficult to negotiate whether you get your house back or not. It can be very difficult. And I think a lot of people think that, you know, when it comes to this world, they've taken possession. There is no God, it's ours. We'll take whatever we want. I've been reading some of the history of Australia, and there's some sad parts to that, taking possession of what you want. But the owner of the field, the owner of the world is actually God. And his intent as he planted people, as he put, as he put people on the earth and caused them and said, be fruitful and multiply, his purpose was that they might multiply and bring his kingdom with them as they, as they lived in obedience to the king, as they lived in obedience to God, their lives would reflect righteousness and communities would grow and families would grow and nations would be established and, and God's purpose would prevail on the earth and wonderful things would happen. That's what God started in the, He said to Adam and Eve, this is what I want you to have a look at this garden. I want you to multiply this. This is what I want you to do. I want you to make this spread throughout the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, have dominion over the earth. The Father's intention then is always to have planted his people on the earth and to, to take possession of the earth in the name of God who created. And the good seed represents good people, people who do the will of God. It's a funny thing in, in, the, in, our, in our garden, the dawn never stops weeding. And yet this parable says we shouldn't pull up weeds. I want you to know that you, if you men if you ever need a biblical reference for not pulling up weeds, here it is. Right? you could destroy good things. Now, I, I went to the strawberry patch early this morning, just walking around and looking at weeds, and I decided to pull up some of the couch grass. I was very careful because I know that strawberry plants are pretty delicate. Once you pull up a piece of couch grass, you know how they go. They go like these long furrows and they, they dig into the ground. You pull them up and you think you're just going to pull up a bit of grass and it pulls up to the fence. And all the strawberry plants go. And they didn't do it. I looked after them. I was very careful. But it's interesting that they... Weeds keep producing weeds and the strawberries keep producing strawberries. That's, isn't that interesting? You don't need Carl Monick to tell you that. I can tell you that. I've studied biology. Whatever plant it is, it keeps reproducing after its own time. And so, from the first parable of the sower sowing the seed of the Word of God into the hearts of men, we now have the Son of Man, Jesus, his intention, sowing his people people who obey him, people who follow him, sowing them into the world that they might follow him. And the enemy comes and he plants another kind of plant. And in this case, it's called a weed. Be careful when you call someone weedy, okay? Don't, don't use that insult because it has implications. That they might be of the devil, okay? So be careful. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, or go in the way that sinners go, nor sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He should be like a tree planted by rivers of living water. It's 
leaf will not wither. It brings forth food, fruit in its season. So here's the picture of you and me as believers in Jesus, as followers of Christ, as those who hear God's word and do it, we're like those trees. We're like the planting of the Lord. So I want to ask you the question this morning, are you the planting of the Lord or not? Because there's another planting, which is weeds, and taking down strawberry patch, you're either strawberry or grass. That's your choice. Now, I know there's lots of varieties of weeds, but that's the choice you get. Not so the wicked, they're like the chaff that the wind blows away. Their, their, their path does not, does not survive. Are you one of those people today? I want to ask this. This is kind of early in the year. It's January. It's a good time to settle this question. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Sitting in a pew in church all year, every time you can, does not make you a Christian, does not make you one of the good planting of the Lord. That's not what makes you a planting. You can be planted in church and not planted in the kingdom. That's what, that's what it means. You, you can be planted somewhere good next to good people. Just because that cooch grass is next to the strawberries doesn't make it better cooch grass. It's probably worse in my opinion because it's robbing us of strawberries. But that's what happens in the world. That's, that's how things have come. The enemy has come in and said to people, no, you don't need to listen to God. You don't need to listen to his words. You don't have to obey him anymore. I mean, we have come of age. Do you realize back in the 1860s, 70s and 80s, 90s, there was a debate in Victoria, across the colonies, but especially in Victoria, about the relevance of, of God's word to the society in which we live. They debated whether God's word still was authoritative because there was a view of creation and six days creation and, and, and Charles Darwin's theories were coming to the colonies and they were reading uh, the, uh, you know, different philosophies and people were abandoning and, and actually moving away from the authority of God's word at that time because they, they, couldn't, they couldn't correlate what they were seeing and hearing from other people and what was happening in the scientific world and what they thought the Bible had always said about science and so people got confused about all that and they started to undermine the authority of God but there was a planting that took place that was a different seed that was not a seed that had the DNA of Jesus in that. You see, when Jesus plants people, he puts his spirit within us. The Bible says we become a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When Jesus comes to dwell in a person, what happens is the DNA of that person is changed. I know some people are afraid of the mRNA vaccines. I'm not going to get into vaccination theory, but just to let you know, people sometimes afraid, and I've heard someone say to me, because it modifies your genetics. Well, actually, nothing can change your DNA that quickly. Otherwise, we'd probably want to do that to each other. <laughs> Excuse me, that look, you know, that face, maybe we can change your DNA and we can get a better face. Or, you know, you seem to be weak in this area, let's change your DNA. It just doesn't work that way. <clears throat> but when you become a new creation, and that's why God doesn't come along and just patch you up and say, oh, yes, I know you look like a weed, but I think if we we plant something else on top of you and graft it in, we can make something good of this. He doesn't do that. To start again and, and a new creation comes, a person becomes a new creation in Christ, they become spiritually alive to God. I want to ask you the question seriously then, are you, do you know that you're the planting of the Lord? Do you know that there's been that, that seed of God's word that's been planted in your heart and it's actually produced the fruit of righteousness, a right relationship with God? You've received grace. Because today would be a really good day to do that. It's, not, it's impossible in the, in, in the natural world for a weed to become a strawberry or a strawberry plant, but it's not impossible for a human being who is a planting of the, of the enemy, who is going his own way, her own way, doing their own thing, going the path that they want to because they want to. It's not impossible for that person to turn around and through repentance and faith actually become someone who has made a new creation in Christ. And I want to invite you into that. You see, the devil has always had plans to disrupt this harvest. He started with Adam and Eve, and he's been doing it ever since. But the planting of the Lord, the person who is this tree planted by streams of living water, is one who receives the word of God, and the word of God takes root in their lives. They meditate on it. They hear and obey it. James says, not being deceived, being hearers only, but those who hear and do what the word says. The planting of the Lord is not someone who came to faith 20 years ago and hasn't done anything with that. If you don't water something, if you plant something and don't water it, it dies. If it's not nurtured, it dies. If it's not living, it dies. If it's not given all the right circumstances, it doesn't live. 
So the Bible invites us, and here's the invitation to you, to know today that you're the planting of the Lord. If you don't know that, if you can't absolutely say, yes, I know that in my heart, Christ dwells by his spirit. In my heart, I live according to what God says because I've been saved by grace through faith. You can't say that. I want to invite you to come today and say that. To come to the Father and say, Father, here I am. I want to walk with you. I want to be yours. You might have wandered away. You might have decided that you're going to plant yourself somewhere else in the world and do something else other than what God wants. And today you could come back and say, hey, Father, I, I realize I've been far away. I stood next to a guy on Clark Oval one day. We were playing football and he wasn't getting enough of the ball and he'd been enraged by his fellow team members who didn't pass the ball to him, kick the ball to him, didn't run very much, but he wanted it to be kicked to him. He was tall enough to mark over other people's heads. And I wanted to him and I said, you're having a tough time. And he really teared up, just about burst into tears. And I said to him, because I, I knew of his mother, I didn't know her personally, I said, the prayers of your mum are still following you. Come and will get away from them. So he accepted that word and we talked about it, but he, a few a few months later, he rang me up on Sunday morning when we weren't allowed to be here. And he wanted to know how, how he could get a hold of the service and get linked into the service. And he said to me, I know the way home because my mum told me. He said the last three days of her life, all she did as she lay in bed dying was quote scripture to me. Tell me the word of God. It was so entrenched in her life. The fruit of God's word that she had taken in was so deep in her life that the very last one, there's nothing else you can do. You can't, you can't even think of what you're doing. Out of her innermost being came the living word of God. And her son knew because of that. And he'd heard her witness before. He'd seen her go to church. But that, because that impacted him, told him the way to get home. You need the way home. You might need the way home. Maybe you need to come back to the Lord today. Well, the second question I want to ask you is, where has the Lord planted you? Where has he planted you? A lot of people are looking for the, the perfect pot plant, the, per, the, the perfect pot, <laughs> the one that's got no weeds in it. I mean, who wants to grow with weeds, right? You heard the saying, how can I fly like an eagle when I live in the turkey yard? Or chicken coop. And we kind of have this view sometimes that, you know, it's all based on where I'm planted. You know, if I was in the right circumstance, if I was in the right environment, if, if I had the right job, if I was married to the right person, by the way, I... I let you know that. <laughs> I'm not sure if Dawn is, but I am. <laughs> I'm sure she'd say the same. But that's, that's what I hear sometimes. That's what I hear. And, and it's, it's sad when, when, when things happen in families. Huh? But, but sometimes we make the excuse that, you know, it's, it's because of where I'm planted. If it wasn't for the weeds, I could be much more fruitful. If it wasn't for the people around me, it wasn't for the church I'm in. Look, I think, I think I, know to, I need to go to a right church. I need to go to the church where... I can thrive, you know, because this church is killing me. So they go from church to church and sometimes, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it says here that the Son of Man planted his seed in the world and the enemy came along and planted the seeds of the weeds next to, alongside of, around the good seed. Why, why, why wouldn't God want to perfect church, at least close to perfect. I mean, I know Sunbury Baptist is pretty close. I mean, I don't think of that. I just want to say that because actually where God has planted us is not just our church, it's our community, it's the world we live in, it's the job we have, it's, it's the environment he's put us in and there's a calling of God on our life. There's something he's actually saying to us about following him, which means hearing the word and doing what he says and being what he wants you to be. Because in that place is where you'll thrive, where you will grow and produce the fruit that he wants. Yes, there'll be people around you who, who are not doing what God wants and may be actually counterproductive in a sense if you listen to them, if you take on board what they're saying and if you listen to the way they do things or the decisions they make. And they may be even very good people, but if they're not walking with the Lord, if they're not being led by the Spirit, then yes, they can have a detrimental effect on your walk, but God has planted you there knowing that you can be sustained because your root goes down to the living water and draws on the Word of God and draws on the life that God gives you. That's where he wants you to be. The call of God is irrevocable. The gifts and the calling of God, he does not take back. One of the reasons I'm passionate about the church and have been for 42 years as a pastor, even before that, is that the church of Jesus Christ is the bride of Christ. It'll be there to meet the bridegroom. I want to be part of it. I want to be part of it. And I'll be whichever part of it, in whatever 
country in whatever nation, whatever part of the city he puts me. Because one of the things I've found is if I don't go where he puts me, then I don't get as ready as he wants me to be. And for some reason, that's the way he produces fruit. Now, you can be a fruit inspector this morning and tell me what fruit you see or don't see. That's up to you. But all I know is the planting of the Lord is where he puts you, where he calls you, what he wants you to do. And I'm going to ask you that question. Do you know where he's planted you? Are you confident in that? If you're the planting of the Lord, do you know that you're in his field? This is the point. A lot of people sort of think that we can go from place to place running for wherever we want to run from in order to be ready because one day we're going to die and then we'll go to heaven and then it'll all be over. All the pain will be gone and we'll be in this perfect paradise. Did you know that in Revelation it says the city of God will come down from heaven and the dwelling place of God will be with man? The landlord has not abandoned his house. That's what it means. The one who created this earth is not about to give it up to Satan. The weeding is coming. The weeding is coming. It will come at the end and what will remain is the kingdom of God. Free of those things. Free of the things. But here's the challenge that we're not supposed to do the weeding yet. So the people who the Lord has planted, who have the DNA of Jesus rather than Satan, they do what they're told, where they're told, when they're told. Because they're following God. It's so funny how even from the days of the Pharisees, the Pharisees thought, you know, they could create a pure religion. In fact, their, their origins come from the, the Hasidim, which means the, the, the pure ones, the ones who are pure in their faith. As Baptists, we're, we're, our ancestors uh, were part of the Puritan Brigade, actually, part of that movement, the Puritan, the, con the confessors of the faith, the ones who would be pure in their faith. They were not going to be caught up in the Catholicism and the politics of the church, we want to be pure in the word of God. Nothing wrong with that. Problem is, so many different varieties of churches, you know, we are purely evangelical. You don't fit in that, go somewhere else. Or we are charismatic, that's our church. So if you're not a charismatic planting of the Lord, then you don't belong here. What are we doing? What's the Lord doing? I mean, the Lord plants people together. He plants us in places where it isn't necessarily perfect and not everyone around you is going to be a spirit-filled Christian if that's your particular label that you think is, is so important. By the way, I think being Christ-centered, Bible-believing, Bible Bible-based, conservative, evangelical, reformed, charismatic, spirit-filled and serving God is a really good thing. I just don't want to put it all in one pot and say that if you don't fit that, you don't come. Because the Lord plants you where he puts you. So often the church wants to weed, don't we? We want to get into the weeding. Let's get rid of the people who don't belong. Let's get rid of the people who don't fit. Let's, let's, let's weed out the ones who aren't true believers and let's have a true believer church. What a sterile environment. In fact, the problem with that is that you, you might not be planted where the Lord wants you to be. We need to be in the community. We need to be, as it were, up to our roots in the places where the weeds grow as well. And the funny thing is, when, when this, when this, this, in this parable... When the owner of the field was asked by his servants, shall we weed the garden? Shall we weed the field? He said, no, you might uproot the wheat. <laughs> and I find it ironic that a lot of times Christians want to be in a kind of a pure wheat pot, almost like you have to be a you know, circumscribed ground with a wall so you don't, get, you don't get polluted by the weeds, and yet you're not going to grow very strong. Jesus was saying it's more dangerous, as it were, to be extricated from the place where I've planted you to be taken away into a safe zone where you can be pure with all the other people who think just like you, that's more dangerous for you because you've been uprooted from where you're planted. When, you, when you're in the place of your planting, when you're in the place where God has put you, then you will grow and you will produce after your own, whatever's in your heart, whatever the seed of God's word that's been planted in you. You see, the, the church can only do its job of reproducing the seed of God's word when those who are in the church are the planting of the Lord planted where he puts them. Yes, there's, there's, there's church part of that, there's community part of that, there's a family part of that, there's a work part of that. Whatever that means for you to be faithful to the calling of God, that's where, that's where you'll grow. That's where you'll produce that fruit. And we don't need to worry, you see, well, we don't need to get into a weeding expedition. And we do around here, and when Carl calls you through a working bee and says, come on, we need to come and get into the weeds and get into the grass. I know he's saying how great it is that the rain comes, but someone has to get on that mower out there and reduce the grass. He's got a spare eight hours, come and see me later and we'll get a mower. We don't need to sort the weed out from the good seed because that's God's job. 
We need to be faithful. We need to be honest with God. We need to walk in His Word. We need to proclaim that Word and share the Word of God. But you will share the Word where you're planted when out of the fruit of your own life, out of the things that God has put within you, you share that life with other people. That will produce fruit. I've sadly seen, you probably have too many Christians who kind of like they stand on this side of the wall and they get handfuls of the Word of God like seed and they throw it over the wall and they say, I planted some more seed today. It's really effective. I'll try it in your own garden and see how it goes. To plant effectively, you've got to be alongside that which you, you planted by. And the, and the miracle is that whatever's in your heart, whatever's in my heart of, of God's word, of obedience to Jesus, of following him, as we live that life, as we love those who are lost, as we get alongside our neighbours, as we reach out to the poor and the needy, as we reach out to the people that God brings across our path, then the seed of God's word does get planted because they see life, not just words, not just thoughts and theories. They see the, they see the life that matters. And they take notice of it because they believe in the love they receive. There is a sorting out coming. Don't make any mistake about that. I will never, by God's grace, and I want to boast about this, but as far as I'm concerned and what I believe now, I will never water down this aspect that there's coming a day of judgment. There's a separation of those who choose not to receive Christ and those who do. I'm just glad I don't have to do that. I would hate to do that. But I know it's coming. I need to tell people it's coming. I need to be faithful to say, you know what? This is your chance. So many times in our ministry, and especially in Sunday housing, we're saying to people, this is your chance. Not just spiritually, accommodation, opportunity. This is it. Here's your chance. Take it. Some do. Some rise to the challenge. Some say, yes, thank you for, for caring for us. Thank you for going the extra mile. Thank you for providing. Thank you the church somehow loves us through you. Thank you for that. No break. There's others. Makes no difference. Never take the chance. Don't make a move. Never respond. And that's how it is with God. That's how it is with the kingdom of God. We cannot dictate how people respond, but we cannot mitigate the judgment that's coming either. It's not up to us. And people have, have debated over this. I had a friend in, in Rotary back in Greensboro. He used to say, I can't believe in a God who, who would do that, you know, who would judge people. So I don't believe in God at all. <laughs> you know, if God doesn't exist, you don't have a problem. If he does, you do have a problem because you've got to answer to him, not to, not to your theory. And I said to him, you know, if, God, if I'm right about God and God's love and grace and opportunity, the moment I die, if I'm wrong, I've lost nothing. I've lost nothing more than you have. But the moment you die, you've lost everything. I'd rather take a chance on God being true and being right than take a chance that there's no God. Now, the Word of God doesn't make a chance. It's a revelation of Christ. So we're not actually talking about gambling here. We're just talking about, you know, making choices. So what do you need to do? What's the plan? What's your vision? What's your vision for life? As a church, we can develop vision. We can talk about what we're going to do this year and the board will be away next weekend. We'll sit and talk and pray about you know some of the things ahead and how, how we can promote the gospel in this city, in this town, in this community, how we can promote discipleship in the church, how we can grow each other, but it doesn't matter what plans we have for that building, for that, for that land out there or for building or for adding to or having more programs. What matters is that there are people who respond to God's word and to the spirit of God and because they're hearing what God is saying, there's a response in the heart that produces the fruit. The planting of the Lord will produce the planting of the Lord again. We uh, had a big gum tree up in front of our ma uh, the manse where we did next door. I don't know if you noticed that. It was a big gum tree. In that storm we had earlier, half of it fell down. <laughs> it's a funny thing in Sunbury. When a tree falls down, it doesn't last long on the ground. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> People are just waiting for it to fall. And then they swoop on it. So th this tree, uh, half of it fell down, and, and Dawn and I were out there because we had, couldn't get out of our drive. We rang the council, and there were trees everywhere, and, you know, counted. We've taken, we've taken your order number, and we've put you on our list. I said, that's great. We'll sit here and wait for you so we can go out, you know, get out of it. So I got my chainsaw out and started chopping up this big tree. My chainsaw's about this big. And the tree was massive, and we started chopping up the limbs. And the SES truck was going down the other way, and they took mercy on us. A couple of old people trying to move. <laughs> gum tree and they did a U-turn and came back and we thought they might have been sent by the oh no no we just saw you out there with a chainsaw 
So they came and they cleaned it all up. Well, it's half the tree just stood there for, for recently. And then the council came and they chopped it down. Right there, right down to the ground. And then a guy came down a few days later and he, and he took out the stump. And you know, I just noticed, and I, it was there all the time, but I noticed that there's this little tree that had been self-sown by the big one. And it's kind of, in, well, just a few metres away. There was the big one and the little one that's just here. And it's, it's about the sign now. I thought, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. That big tree got to see one of its offspring, one offspring that came from it, one offspring, and it's, and it's, it's got life after its death, after the dead ones, after the big one's gone. Now, I don't know how many other seeds might have been scattered from that big tree and taken by birds, and there might be a forest somewhere, I don't know. But I do know there's one tree that survived, and I guess it gave me inspiration. The inspiration is this, if you're the planting of the Lord, what are you reproducing? What are you reproducing? And where are you reproducing? Because living things reproduce. It's okay to be in church and be nurtured and be loved and, and be surrounded by people who encourage you. That's what, that's what we come. That's what we do. And you know, there's times when you protect small plants and you, you protect weak plants and you make sure there's either a stake alongside them or you, you grow them up and you want them to be protected from, from the enemy. But there's a time when that plant has to stand on its own and start to reproduce the seed that's in it that it can produce into the future. And that's what God's calling us to. If you, if you would see one person come to Christ through your witness, through the fruitfulness of your prayer and your life and witness to them and sharing with them, imagine that. Imagine sitting here, you know, January next year and every one of us brought one person that had been led to Christ. What would it look like? We would get in the, in the door. Is that a challenge for you as God's planting? Will you take that as a challenge? Where he's planted you, he wants you to be fruitful. And being fruitful means you reproduce that which you have in your heart. And if in your heart you have the word of God and it's watered by the spirit and it's in the soil of the structure of the nutrients of the place where he's put you, then reproduce Christ and share him with other people. We, we, we have these debates about, you know, we just need to love people and let them see by our actions of the word. Well, the word is both action and word. The word, the revelation of God is both the spoken word and the life lived in consistency. It's not, it's not a choice between one or the other. You don't get to live the Christian life without speaking or throw words at people without living it. You've got to do both. That's what the planting is about. It's only the live trees. It's the ones who are alive, who, who have roots down, who, who actually produce the fruit. The fruit produces the seed. The seed's in the fruit and that gets planted. And you know how it goes. That's what God's looking for from us. The love of God planted in our hearts, sown into the world, producing Christ in others. That's what matters. The church grows out of that fantastic. If the church multiplies and gets much bigger than it is fantastic, if people go to the ends of the earth, oh, there's a planting of Lord. That's fantastic too, isn't it? That's what happened in order for us to be Christians. People came from overseas to bring the gospel to this country. Keep producing good seed. Pray at all times in the Spirit. Meditate on the Word of God. Draw on the living water of the Holy Spirit. Put your roots down where God has planted you. Make sure you know where that is. Get on with living life where you are. One of the things about trees is they don't look across the paddock and wish they're on the other side. A good tree, a fruitful tree, will stay where it is until someone bigger, stronger, mightier who owns the tree moves it doesn't move itself, it doesn't get envious of the other side of the paddock, it just sits there. And the longer it sits there, the more fruit it produces, normally. I wonder if you want to be part of the planting of the Lord. I want to invite you as we sing this last song, and I invite the band up if you'll come. This last song is an invitation song. It simply says, so you would come. The Father has done all this, so you would come. Before the world began, you were on his mind. Every tear you cry, precious in his eyes. Because of his great love, he gave his only son. Everything was done so you would come. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to invite you to do something if you, if you want to. Um, because I feel personally that I, that I need to come to the Father at the start of this year. The last two years have been, have been tough years. Um, I've got close a few times, I'll be honest, of wanting to just walk away and say, that's it, had enough. Can't do this anymore. It's too hard. And there's people in church, no one in church. People leave church, don't come back again. 
preaching to a camera, preaching to a it just gets too hard. Just, then the troubles and the strife and the ministry and then overwhelmed and behind and things. And you think, no, nope. 67, that's right. <laughs> Read the calendar, that's retirement age. Got a problem with that. My father was 89 and still working, so I got a bit of a problem with that. It's a bit of an example for me to come run away from. But I want to come. I want to actually say, Father, here I am. Paul Craig. I'm going to stand at the front here, facing the front, just because I want to be the first person to respond to this invitation. Say, Lord, yes, I am your planting. I know that. I'm no what I am. You may not know that, but if you want to join me and say, I want to be the planting of the Lord, I want to be where he wants me to be and do what he wants me to do. I want to respond to the Father's will. I want to be in his kingdom. I want to be in his kingdom purpose. I, I'm not going to look around and, and, and try and guess where I should be, where I want to be, what, what I think is best for me, what I think is best for my family. I want to be what, where the Father says. I want, to, I want to be planted where he says. I want to do what he wants me to do. And for me, that's definitely Sunbury Baptist here now, whatever that means for this year. Whatever that means. And, and you know, it's, I don't know what that means. I don't know who who will be with me in that. I don't know who will be with Dawn and I in that. But this is my invitation to you. The planting of the Lord and the house of the Lord. And if you come forward, it doesn't mean that you're committing to Sunbury Baptist, by the way. That's not the point. The point is the kingdom. The point is God's kingdom. God's kingdom in your heart, alive and well, watered by the Holy Spirit and ready to bear fruit as he calls it. Let's see, stand.
penetrate through the hard places, through the thorny places, through all the places to get to the hearts of people that they might become the planting of the Lord. Your name we pray. And, um, if, you, if you've responded just now and you, and you want prayer, you want to pray whatever you've said, that's fine. If not, you can go back to your seat. But if you would like to just make that statement to someone who stand next to someone and say, oh, can you pray for me? Can you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes confessing something that you're just committing to is a, is a good thing. It turns into your own heart and life, and I just want to encourage you to have a great week. God bless you. Trust that as you go about your, your, your business this week, that you'll remember that God has planted things in your life for a very good reason. He wants to produce fruit that glorifies you. Amen. God bless you.